Hello, hello, and welcome to the Rock Metal Podcast. I'm your host, John Harris, and today we have Jameson Ketchum, and he has a new book called Name Dropping, Seeking Creative Truth Through Trendy Altruism and Punk Rock, which is released on June 29th via Ask You Publishing. Right now, I'm being joined by Jameson himself to share some more about this book. So, Jameson, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Yeah, great to have you on. And in the pre-roll, we were chatting about how I I don't get books very often, but uh, through Mm -hmm. you, we chatted with Lindsay Manfredi of Cold when she wrote a book, and so we chatted with her. And then now you've written a book and reached out, and I thought, well, I'm pretty sure people who listen to music also read books. I gosh, that's that's what all of this is banking on. I I really hope so, man. So I guess that brings me to a very unique and interesting first question. Did you write this just to get it out and you're hoping people read it? Or did you write it with the intention that someone's going to read it? And I guess, because I know part of it is a little self-help in a way. Yeah. Yeah, I think both. I it, When I started writing it, it was way more just, I felt like my memory was fading for a lot of stories. And I thought, I, I want to get these down, even if they're just for like friends that were there. And just for my own, just journaling almost. Um, And I think after a while I was like, oh man, I've written way more than I thought. And just going back even through my old journals and being like, oh, there's stories here that I'd completely forgotten about. I wrote them down, threw the notebook away, you know. So I I started to think, can I shape this in a way that's uh, not only entertaining, but maybe helpful, maybe inspiring. I don't know necessarily a ton of other music journalists, uh, especially that started around the same time as me. So there's a, certainly a hope that people read it and want to, you know, also write about music or find their way into an industry that so many people love. I feel like we have the most access to it right now. So if I can contribute any little thing to just like, hey, yeah, you can do this. I don't have a journalism degree. I barely have an English degree. Like. <laughs> There's lots. There's ways in. You don't have to have all the credentials in the world. If that makes sense. It does, and that brings me to a very simple question, which is something that you mentioned. There was access to musicians and ways in to start uh, a career as a music journalist. Now, I guess take us through that. How did you get started mm-hmm. into it? How would you do it now if you were to start today? Yeah, starting out, I think I was just had this like weird unhealthy obsession with with (laughs) music primarily with with lyrics like I have no musical talent I can't play a thing I can't tell you how many times as a kid I like bought a cheap guitar and like this is the time we're doing it or you know a keyboard or something it just never happened no talent at all um but I had such a like obsession with it and I would like always like pour I'd buy a cd and like pour over the lyrics i'd read i read the thank yous like what other bands are they thanking i should go listen to them now so i just had this thing that i thought i'm really really into this can this translate to anything useful <laughs> at all and initially it was just going to shows and, and meeting the bands and looking back i had no purpose for doing that it was just there was something about can i meet the person that wrote this song that impacted me so much and then after a while you thought, is there a way that I can help these people? Is there a way I can even just, you know, write about them? Just do any, like, I just wanted to touch it somehow. And eventually I I had a friend who was running a radio station. He wanted to start a magazine uh, based off the radio station. And by that point, we kind of just both had enough credits under our belt that we're like, well, we've, you know, seen Amberlynn a handful of times and we talked to those guys. I bet they would do it. I bet they would let us, you know, interview them. And oh, did you lose me? I did for a second. You were talking about Amber Lynn, and then okay. it froze. Okay, yeah. So uh, that was like an example of going to shows, talking to bands, and then eventually being like, "I've talked to some of these bands enough. I wonder if I could ask them this favor to be in our first magazine." You know, so like that—that that became Hope Core magazine, and Amber Lynn was our first cover back in like 2010. So uh, it was—it really started with just doing it on my own and then getting enough credits and enough uh enough contacts through that that i started to apply to stuff like substream magazine ant magazine alternative press and just say hey i know i just have this little publication on my own 
but look at some of these bigger names I've gotten. Here's some of my writing samples. And if anyone's listening to this too, you're, you're going to volunteer for a long time. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, at the same time, you're going to get national exposure, you know, in magazines or publications. You're going to get to talk to huge bands. You just might not be making any money for a while. <laughs> yeah. I can attest to that. <laughs> yeah. Yep. I, yeah. I know. I know you can. <laughs> yeah. I've been doing this for five years, and we just now started making, and I don't mean that I can live off of it, Jameson. I mean that sure. I, I can now buy name brand uh, macaroni and cheese. Ooh, that's that's really the dream for me. Yeah. I've, I've had a podcast for almost four years, and, and yeah, I only only money going out the door, I'll tell you that. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Whenever somebody comes up to me and excitedly says, John... I've started a podcast. I look at them and I shake them and I go, why? Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> like, but you do that. And I'm like, ah, you know, I don't know why. It's a, Speaking of unhealthy obsessions, it's definitely a part of my life that I should get looked at. Yeah, yeah. No, and I, uh, <laughs> not to just say, yes, yes, I agree, John. Uh, you should get that looked at. Uh, but I, I think, I don't know, I, I tend to think with, with anyone that has a hobby that they're really into, like I struggled for a long time with, with podcasting, with writing where I thought financially, this is not a great idea. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like, like, yeah, money is only going out the door most of the time. And if there's money coming in, it's not, you know, it's not profit. Um, so that you definitely have that struggle of like this. Yes, this is a hobby, but how much can I spend on this hobby before it becomes almost not a hobby? (laughs) Mm -hmm. I think, I think you know what I mean? Oh Yeah. I do. Thankfully, my son is old enough now that he's starting to help, and that's evening out the workload a little bit. But uh, that's what I need to get. Yeah, I need an intern. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> sweet. So something that you mentioned there, that I thought was great because I've wrestled with the very thing that you said. I'm sure some people listening in uh, caught it, which was I have this passion in, or an unhealthy obsession. Mm-hmm can I translate it into something useful? Yeah, it's, and that's, I I feel like that's maybe the thesis of doing, probably of doing anything creative, really. Uh, Can I translate this into something useful? Am I getting enough out of it uh, to keep doing it? Am I doing, and then therefore, am I doing it for the right reasons? You know, you hear the cliche thing of like, well, if you're, making music or writing a book to, you know, to make money, then you're not going to because you're not, you know, that's not the point and stuff. But I I get that. And that's like a really youthful, cool ideal. But when you're an adult and you have bills to pay, you you have to think about that. It'd Mm. be stupid not to. So, Mm. uh, yeah. So I'm, and I, I think through writing this too, I started to think, do I have any other obsession? Like, did I waste, (laughs) a lot of time on this one when I maybe should have been uh, learning like a trade or doing something that was going to benefit me at 35 rather than just like, well, I got a ton of cool posters and CDs. Yeah. (laughs) I got to meet this guy. Yeah. And everyone's like, cool. Yeah. I liked them when I was 15 and you're like, ah, sweet. Yeah. They're still, they're they're still relevant, man. Yeah. I get in those fights. uh, I don't know about you. I get in those (laughs) fights like on Facebook and stuff all the time of, uh-oh. You know, saying like, oh, man, I really like this, uh, you know, new Taking Back Sunday song. And somebody, you know, inevitably, oh, there's still a band. And you're like, well, clearly you don't know what you're talking about. They've been putting out new music all the time. <laughs> and, you know, yeah. you get that yeah, instant grandpa argument going. Mm-hmm. Speaking of fighting, you brought up Cobra Kai, so I have some swag. Oh, yes. Let me see. Uh, so the one that a lot of people have seen is um, in the wintertime, I was wearing my Cobra Kai sweater. Mm-hmm. Uh, but one that I don't think anybody has seen just yet, other than the outside world, is my Eagle Fang Karate. Oh, is that is it in a long sleeve? Uh, yeah, kind of like a uh, three quarter oh. sleeve. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I can't remember what the name of the the shirt design is called, but um, like a baseball shirt. There's a name for it. Yeah, I call them baseball shirts. Yeah. Uh, so there's that that's one. Awesome. And that one stumps people in in real life. They think it's it's real. Um, I, I've <laughs> yeah, yet to, I take my kid to Eagle Fang Karate. Yeah, uh, I I have actually yet to have people. Someone come up to me and be like, "Dude, Cobra Kai, that's amazing!" Instead, I either get people walking around me nervously, 
or somebody going, I've never heard of that school. Where is it? <laughs> In Hollywood. Uh, that's awesome. Yeah. That logo is just so sick. I know. And to think to think that it's like, you know, what, for uh, 30, I mean, 40 years old? No. When did that come out? Early 80s? 1984, I want to say. 84, you're right. Yep. It and just looks like it's brand new. Looks like it's from today. I know. And, well, in the school, even in 1984, the, the school was old because according to the show that we've been watching, he formed the school in, what, the 70s? Oh, that's right. Yeah. Or maybe it would have been like the really, really early 80s. So that logo, even back then, was pretty dialed in. I mean, not that that was that far away. Right. Um, but the funny thing is, is it's orig- it's an original logo, right? But I was thinking to myself, man, if they just came out with this show, this logo was dialed in. And then I had to stop myself and go, well, yeah, because. Yeah. Do you find that uh, whenever someone says like, oh, would you recommend Cobra Kai? I feel like I can never give just a just a yes I, I have to be like, well, how much did you watch it as a kid? Like, what's what's your background with it? Because it's because people have been like, oh, I watched it; it was so cheesy. And I'm like, well, did you like the movies? Oh no, I never saw the movies. It's like, well, you can't you can't do one without the other, really. Of course, it's cheesy. Yeah, yeah. My wife calls it a soap opera for men. Oh, that's spot on. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, uh, but we did. When was it? I think it was around Thanksgiving. We sat down, we did a marathon, and we watched all three Karate Kid movies after we had watched, I think it was up to season three at that point. They hadn't come out with season four just yet, mm-hmm. if I'm right. Um, and yeah, interesting enough, even though my wife is like, oh, it's a, you know, it's a soap opera for men. She was getting into it, and she's like, okay, I'm starting to make some new connections. I'm seeing Daniel differently now, blah, blah, blah. Johnny looks different. Yep. It, it's retelling the story that we all grew up with. Yeah. And it's just, it's, I mean, I know, I think the nostalgia thing, I mean, this would tie in perfectly with what I've written about. Even I think the nostalgia thing gets a lot of grief for saying, oh, you know, we're kind of recycling our childhoods and all that. And there's, there's certain ones where I do think, okay, like it's, it's too much, like just come up with something new. But then something like Cobra Kai comes out and you're like, well, yeah, that was the thing I loved as a kid. I would love to see what you do with it now. Even if it was terrible, I think I'd still watch it because I just want to see, I want to see them today. And mm-hmm. they brought back everybody, which is it's just nuts. Yeah, incredibly nuts. They keep bringing stuff people people back, and uh, along with that, music connection wise, <laughs> there is a resurgence, especially coming out of the pandemic, of eighties esque music under the genre of AOR, album oriented rock. Mm-hmm. And we've got a lot of these bands coming up, like Kane, Shea Kane, Midnight City. I've had them on the show a couple of times now where it's like sleazy glam rock, but it's been recorded and written today. Yeah, yeah. I have a, a good friend. Um, he plays in the band Fallstar, who's on Facedown, but he's he's in another band called Cobra Cobra, and it's the same thing where it's just, yeah, are we, it, it was kind of like, it seemed like a conversation of, are we all really going to sit here and deny that this music is, isn't like amazing? <laughs> like there was a, it's same with like, I always use like new metal as an example like there was a period where new metal and maybe still but like it it was very cool then it became very lame Mm -hmm. and now i think everyone that's kind of in their 30s and in the music scene they're like no like papa roach is pretty badass like no like limp biscuit you know like yeah those those bands get like a ton of crap but yeah i don't know i i think once you reach that not caring about the coolness factor anymore and you like what you like you're just like oh yeah these bands are amazing Mm -hmm. i had on Uh, a professor from Norway who teaches a class on the history of heavy metal, among other Mm -hmm. uh, music related classes. And he said that when he covers new metal, people, people, sometimes people leave. Sometimes people are like, that's not metal. (laughs) There's still a, there's still a thing with that, but. Oh yeah. Now something else you mentioned, and Mm -hmm. it seems that you cover this in the book is because we were chatting about developing skills around your creativity and with commercial consideration. And that's, I think, what I like to use as a term is, well, of course you're doing things for the money. Should nobody get paid? Like, what about what about a firefighter? Should he not get paid? What about a police officer? Should he not get paid? He's putting his life on the line every mm-hmm. single day to keep us safe. Should he not get paid because it's a passion project? You know, mm-hmm. so... Um, I call it commercial consideration. 
When the Foo Fighters are recording a record, they are intending to sell the shit out of it. Right. But they're still they writing. Don't, it's a problem. Yeah, but they're still writing music yeah. that they would write. So I think that's where it comes in. Like, well, if you're going to try and write something that isn't you, then it's going to come off as inauthentic and it's not going to sell. We get that. But um, mm-hmm. have commercial consideration for your for your passion. But something that you mentioned oh, yeah. uh, was how can I help these people? So take us through that. How did you figure out how to – what kind of help do musicians need where you found the solution to that problem? Yeah. Yeah, well, there, so there's a couple of things to that. I mean, I would never sit here and be like, well, Amberlynn really needed me to talk about their music. You know, it's 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 certainly not that. Uh, it, more of, I think, how can I support, how, how can I even in some small way support and promote a thing that's helped me a lot? You know, you know, Foo Fighters put out an album that really impacts you and you tie it to all these memories, you tie it to people, like you tie it to all these really personal things in your life. I think... I think for me then there was a drive of can I do any small part, not only to kind of like, quote, be a part of that that thing or that energy, but to um, promote it, really. So and and again, it's not, you know, the Foo Fighters don't need us to talk about them. They have they have plenty. Um, But like for people like me and you who are just giant music fans, there's just something about trying to be a part of that flow, I think. So whether you write a review or you end up interviewing the band, and it goes into a magazine it goes on a website um i think there's just sort of a thank you there i remember a few years back when i was going to well obviously before covid but uh going to shows a lot more frequently i had this and it's so simple but i had this idea of like now when i if i'm just passing a band in the hallway or saying hi at the merch table or whatever rather than just like hey great set which is what they hear a thousand times a night i thought i'm gonna start just saying like you know introduce myself and just kind of be like thanks for making this album you know thanks for playing here tonight thanks for this specific song and i don't know if you're promote, super familiar with let live that band um but jason their singer that's how i ended up kind of developing a friendship with with him and others but i remember crossing paths with him at a show and being like hey i just wanted to say like this one song i've just i've had it on repeat it just gets me like so excited for the day just thanks for writing this song and he, it just felt like he was very caught off guard and very like, whoa, like that. Yeah, you, mm-hmm. you could have just said good show, good set, whatever. Uh, but it just felt like it hit a little differently. And he just, you know, gave me a big hug. And so I think that there was just something about wanting to say thanks in that broader way, whether you're writing a review, an interview, even tweeting about it. I think there's just something that's, yeah, something nice about just paying back a little bit, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. If there's anything I've found, and maybe you can concur with this one, Jameson, is that, especially on tour, musicians are just looking for a human connection. Yeah. <laughs> and I think so. It's almost like fans don't really provide that because they're idolizing them and they're afraid mm-hmm. to approach them and they speak to them differently. So I find that, especially if I'm like backstage with them and I'm just talking to them like normal people, they just mm-hmm. dig that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I did some a uh, handful of touring, uh, in my twenties and not, not big tours or big bands or anything like that. But even just as someone who was somewhat tagging along and doing interviews here and there, that was my favorite thing was, you know, yeah. Why else would I be in this tiny town in California, uh, at this little venue? Like I'll probably never be here again. And I got to, you know, talk to people about whatever, you know, sometimes if they were going through a breakup or something that was just not even music related. And so I think, yeah, I think there is that connection piece that's just, this is maybe a once in a lifetime interaction. Um, and I, you know, like, I don't know about you, but I, I definitely cringe at the, you know, seeing people meet meet their hero, meet a band, and then just having either like nothing to say or just kind of like fawning and being like, you're great, you're so pretty, or you're, you know, whatever. <laughs> Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't ever want to sound like I'm, I'm so above being a fanboy because I, I am a huge fan obviously, but yeah, I think after a while I just thought, what's something maybe that I can give back to them, even if I just have a few minutes to talk to them that I can say, to say thanks for, for what they've given me, which is a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, I still do it. There's, there's some phone calls where I'm dialing up on Skype and it starts ringing and I'm under my desk in a fetal position. <laughs> who were some of those for you 
Uh, I've been able to chat with most, if not all, of the musicians that I've spent the last 20-plus years listening to, reading in magazines, playing their riffs um, from uh, members of Soil Work to uh, In Flames. I was backstage drinking beer with In Flames. Uh, what else? Who else was there? Children of Bodom. A lot of metal bands, obviously. If there's anybody who's not in a metal band, let me, I have to think for a second. Uh, just recently, <laughs> I chatted with Dino Cazares from Fear Factory. Mm. Yeah, and that was a series. He came on screen, and I was just like, ah. <laughs> uh, "I did that recently with uh, with Sonny from POD, <laughs> and uh, and I and I've interviewed him a few times over the years and stuff. But yeah, there's you know, and it sounds like this is kind of what you're talking about. But you don't ever obviously want it, this to be old hat. You want to be like, yeah, I'm talking to a person that I was listening to when I was 15 and you know, who would have ever thought? And I just love those sort of full circle yeah. things. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, some, uh, ex members of corn, ex members of breaking Benjamin. And those were some of those moments where I was like, okay, things are starting to get a little bit bigger for me. Yeah. Was it a, uh, was it head from corn at the time or who did you talk with? Uh, David. Silva? Yeah. Yeah, chatted, That's awesome. Yeah, chatted with David, and that was kind of a cool thing where I was just like, yeah, my son Gabriel is taking drum lessons, and he was actually just learning Freak on a Leash, and so I was like, son, get over here. This is the drummer. <laughs> this is the guy. This is the guy. <laughs> and the funny thing is, my son t- takes it for granted because he, he just shows sure. up, right? So he's just like, oh, hey, David, how's it going? Yeah, my drum instructor was showing me Freak on a Leash, blah, 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 and they, like, they were just chatting for a second, and I'm just like, what is yeah. going on right now? <laughs> That's, and that's a whole other level. Level. That's you showed your kid music you loved when you were younger, and mm-hmm. now he gets to chat with the guy that, yeah, that's a whole other thing. Yeah, <laughs> that's, yeah, that's, uh, there's a word for that. I can't remember what that is. Grandfathering children into music or something, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> cool. Now, something that was expressed in the book that I dug, very candidly written, I was immediately absorbed into the, the candor in, in the way that you uh, carry yourself. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. <laughs> And one of the, the notes, because I, I couldn't have summed, summed it up better myself, is one minute he's sleeping under vans in Walmart parking lots, and the next minute he's staring A-list creatives in the face. So take us through that. What is that like emotionally to you know, be in a van down by the river, as per <laughs> you know, SNL, and then go, you know, this A-list person... Yeah, I think it was always so the the band that I toured with was the one I mentioned earlier, Fall Star, who I toured with the most. And because of, I mean, yeah, we would be staying in a Walmart parking lot, uh, you know, eating. Um, I, can, I can't remember what they're called, like those little sausages out of cans. They're super gross. Vienna um, sausages. Yes. Yeah. I shouldn't say they're gross. Obviously, a lot of people love them. There's some Super Bowl um, people right now who are just angry that you just said that those canned sausages. I know. <laughs> I think it was the context. I think it was getting out of a hot van and peeling open that can and knowing that was all you had for the day. Um, you know, putting peanut butter on saltine crackers for your lunch and stuff. Uh, so, yeah, going going from just this, like, kind of helpless feeling. I mean, there was a lot of breakdown moments um, of just, like, what are we doing out here? And, like, you know, we have beds at home. Like, we have people that feed us. Like, why are we choosing to be out here? Uh, that, yeah, that could be one morning or one whole day. And then, you know, you go to Cornerstone that night and I'm sitting there with, you know, Aaron Gillespie or half of Under Oath or something. And, um, I think it was just, I liked the difference. I liked that a day could go that way, um, and vice versa. But at the same time, I think you would do an interview like that. You'd wake up the next day at Walmart again and be like, oh yeah, nothing means anything. (laughs) Or like just just because you do this like one big interview or you meet this one big person, uh, your life's not going to change the next day. So I think it was an interesting thought experiment to kind of work through. Um, nothing's ever guaranteed. Nothing's promised to you. Uh, mm-hmm. You have to. You better make sure that you know you might have this awesome interview on Saturday night, uh, but you better make sure Sunday night's also ready to go. Yeah. Like you got, just. I think it just instilled a hustle big time. Mm-hmm. It's work, a lot of work. Uh, yeah, ton of work, not a lot of reward. Um, maybe that's that's though. Like maybe that's uh, you know not doing it for the money, not doing it for the rewards or the stories or anything. But uh, knowing that you could be at home living a little more cushy, 
and instead you choose to go out and live like a garbage person. Um, but at the same time, because of my position, I also was waking up a garbage person and then getting to do an interview that night with, you know, Stephen Christian or, or Head or something, something that just certainly made it all worth it. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's very true. And then something else that starts to happen too. Uh, Stephen Covey calls it the private victory before you have the public victory. Mm -hmm. Um, And I call it the six degrees of separation. I didn't start off chatting with David from Corn. Right. It's taken a number of years for the connections to get made, those six degrees of separation. Mm -hmm. Um, And a lot of the people I've met on the back end that, you know, an interview would never get made sort of thing, or sometimes an interview does get made. Like, um, I chatted with somebody who used to work at Capitol Records and they had they were behind like Jimmy Eat World, for example, and less than Jake. Mm-hmm. You wouldn't know that person. But right. I mean, they started shooting out names of people that I've only seen specials on that they know personally. Mm-hmm. So you start getting that yeah. that six degrees of separation that takes time. And I guess from that there's a bit of reward because sure there's no money coming in and sure you're I know a garbage person. But in that translation, how can this this skill set translate into an actual skill set? Something you mentioned was helping people, figuring out how to then help people. You start making these connections. Yeah, yeah, and I think that that's uh, whether it's ex- whether it's like really really expressed in the book. Um, I, I feel like it should have been something I said every few sentences of just the. I mean, it sounds so like businessy, but like the importance of networking. Um, mm-hmm. But more so, it it is important. But I don't know. I think I just I never approached that of, as as more of like a business thought. More of like I enjoy meeting people in this industry and making genuine friends. Uh, you know, the really cliche thing from almost the movie Almost Famous is you don't make friends with the rock stars, and that's they you know explain that in the movie as to why. Um, but that was the thing I thought if if I ever heard that, if I ever heard an industry person say that to me seriously, I, I might have to quit. Um, and it's not not a status thing as much as if I'm going to spend 30 minutes even with you on my podcast, like we're going to get into some stuff and hopefully that's a memorable thing. You know, that's not a quick, hey, good set as you walk by them at a show. Hey, we spent 30 minutes or 60 minutes together. Uh, me asking you really personal questions Mm -hmm. like that that means something there's like a lot of weight to that Mm -hmm. so and and as far as kind of like the connection piece i'm sure you've seen this too but if i had some sort of tree that i or graph that i could write out uh i could trace back what some you know somebody i'm talking to this week for an interview back to you know maybe back through 10 people 10 people in two years ago this is how i got there Mm -hmm. so yeah, there's a big, uh, big element of, you know, never burn bridges and ask what you can do for people too. like people remember that mm-hmm. the, the best relationships I've had besides with just meeting people that I already admire because their music is a ton of managers and publicists, the people that are kind of the gatekeepers to these bands and you kind of have to impress to begin with. Um, that's a hard relationship to not have it come off as just, hey, I, I need something from you. How can I butter you up and get it? You know? Yeah. I like butter. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, cool. Something I was reminded of was a Zig Ziglar quote. And if nobody out there knows who Zig Ziglar is, he is uh, like a self-help guru. I don't know if you want to call him that. Mm. Uh, stuff that you would stuff, – stuff that predates like Tony Robbins, that kind of thing. You know, you read it, you feel better about yourself. Um, if you help enough people get what they want, you will get everything that you want. That's awesome. Yeah. So if anybody wants to look up Zig Ziglar, I recommend it. Um, And that is one of my favorite quotes from him. And I think that kind of in a roundabout way sums up the book in our conversation is, you know, if you help enough people get what they want using the conduit of your skills, your talents, then you will get everything that you want. That's the hope. That's the hope. (laughs) But don't, yeah, don't go around helping people because you want to get something in return. Now we're starting to go down that rabbit hole, right? Yeah, yeah. Whole other episode there. Now it is a whole other episode. We'll have to do a part two where we go down rabbit holes. Yes, we got plenty of them, I think. Cobra mm-hmm. Kai. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> totally. Sweet. Okay, so we chatted about Cobra Kai. We chatted about music journalism. We chatted about developing skills to help people. We chatted about Zig Ziglar. We chatted about um, waking up in a Walmart parking lot. We chatted about uh, Head. We chatted about David. We chatted about all kinds of people from Corn, uh, New Metal. Uh, was there anything that we we missed, Jameson? Oh, I mean, I'm sure there's I'm sure there's a lot we could go over. Um, I know you're more of a metal guy, but did you have did you have a emo phase, Warp Tour that, that era of things? Um, yeah, I, I listen to a lot of stuff, and I actually have. Well, emo isn't that much of a thing right now, I guess. But um, like red jumpsuit apparatus, like all that kind of stuff. Story of the yeah. year. Uh, that fits. Yeah, it's become really broad. I think. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, I definitely have had a lot of different styles of music on on the sh- on the show, for sure. Mostly, I would say I'm into trance, which is kind of funny, and metal, and then occasionally I splash in just about everything else, like jazz <laughs> and hip hop, and jazz That's to totally hip hop right. beats. Oh yeah, it's there's there's no genres, there's no meaning anymore. No, it's fine. No, you don't need meaning. <laughs> You know. I would say uh, for now, depending on when this is going to be uh, released, I don't have um, the pre-order for this is not up yet. They're going to do it right before the release at the end of this month. Uh, so for now, I've just been directing people to uh, the Instagram for the book, which is at name dropping book. Cool. This will air in July, so the book will be out by then. But any oh. <laughs> I- I- any means that people can uh, quickly yeah. connect with the book. I've got your website uh, that I will post in the show notes. Cool. And from there, people should be able to find out everything they need to know about you and where to buy the book and pick up the book and read the book and all those wonderful things. Awesome. Yeah. And I'll send you everything when that's, since it's not until July, I'll send you all the, any other pertinent info. So I appreciate it, man. This is awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for coming on to the show today, Jameson. No problem. Have a good day.